Welcome back to another episode, Scott. Never too serious. Glad we did our introductions. I'm going to bring you to my level, dude. All right. So <laughs> what I like to do in my free time is I like to mess around on the FOIA website, which is the Freedom of Information Act. And then um, something led me to the CIA because I came across a weird article titled Adam and Eve. I don't know if you've ever seen the article or document published by Adam and Eve, but uh, I'll give you a little break. What do you think? What do you think it's about? Just give me a shot. In the well, I mean, me having this religious background, I would say it has something to do with religion, but uh... so that's a good guess. All right. Well, I'm <laughs> going to share this document with you and we're going to choose which you want to look at. So there's one from the NSA, which is known as the secret of Adam and Eve. It's about three pages long. It's like a little kind of story, but it's on the N. Are you seeing what I'm seeing yet? I am seeing. Yeah. OK, so there's the NSA one right there. You see that it says dot gov. It's. That's authorized as the government. Yeah, legit. There's the Adam and Eve story by the CIA. That's the CIA's website. Secret teachings of all ages index CIA. I don't know which one you want to dive into. Um, we could dive into the one I've already clicked into. It's 633 pages. Let me just say, yeah. if this is an episode <laughs> for anyone to be like, what the hell is our government doing? This is exactly the episode. So would you like to start at the top? And I would. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, this is totally new to me. Oh, it's new to me, too. I just found this out like an hour ago. I was like, oh, is that right? <laughs> so The Secret of Adam and Eve by Jennifer Wilcox in May 19. Let me see. I got to move my screen over a little bit. In May 1943, Adam and Eve only resembled what their descendants would become huge gray machines standing seven feet high, 10 feet long and two feet wide. But Adam and Eve were merely components, motors and wires spread across workhorses and mounted in cabinets in building 26 of the National Cash Register Company in Dayton, Ohio, like the machines they proceeded they held nearly 400 vacuum tubes 64 individually wired bakelite rotors and innumerable feet of wire there were first of their kind the u.s navy crypto analytic bombs and they were about to change history so i don't think it's religious but already from just Whoa. that first thing what the fuck it's the nsa's web i mean sorry to drop a curse bomb right in the beginning but jesus like it's the <laughs> nsa website and this is where i i used to when I was in college, uh, research a lot of this stuff because I did a lot of my psychology stuff on um, MK Ultra, which is considered mm -hmm. widely a conspiracy theory. But there's documents on the CIA website, much like there's a document right here on the NSA website, which is the National Security Agency. What do you think this yeah. is all about? You think this is like bait, like kind of influence to maybe someone from another country coming across our stuff that might be kind of propaganda or fake information? Well, they're talking about some sort of like secret machine um is this like early spying uh 1943 but crypto analytic bombs yeah i don't is this i mean this is like old school technology really old school technology i'm not sure what the heck they're talking about crypt crypto logic Logic bombs. Can I, should what I continue to read on? This yeah, one? please do. So for three months, 800 U.S. Navy officers, sailors, and waves worked day and night to construct the bombs. For what purpose, they did not know. Clearly, the machines were important. So important that the U.S. Navy actually approved and assigned an engineer of German descent with relatives still in Germany to design the machine. Ooh, sounds a little bit like Operation Paperclip. What was that, 1945, <laughs> 1946? Everyone mm -hmm. was assigned to the project, was sworn to secrecy, but only a few actually knew the secret machine's first class Phil Bocino and radio men KP Cook were not among those few, yet they would be the first to use the machines. They spent the past few days getting Adam and Eve in working order, finding and fixing leaks as oil dripped from the various pieces. Although run on electricity, there were hundreds of moving parts requiring lubrication, ensuring proper contact of the copper brushes on the Bakelite rotors and the metal points wired to other parts of the large apparatus was crucial to the machine's accuracy. Phil and KP made certain those contacts were, ma were made and speed was maintained. Personnel in the Navy's cryptologic organization, OP-20G in Washington, D.C., had been in virtually constant contact with officers and engineers in Dayton throughout the design and construction phase. Now the secure communication lines carried specific instructions to the National Cash Register Company. Phil and KP will be responsible for those instructions to test the Navy bombs. I'm going to look OP-20G in Washington, I'm... D.C. I'm going to search Google for that. I should duck, duck, go the shit out of it. So yeah. OP-20G, or Office of Chief of Naval Operations, 20th Division of the Office mm -hmm. of Naval Communications. Did they? What is one of my? Oh, my God. There's. I don't oh, wow. Can I zoom into this? 
some old school. Staff functions, assistant director of Naval mm -hmm. communications for communication intelligence, direct the planning and operations of the entire U S Naval communications intelligence organization and maintains necessary. Uh, I can't read that one. It's a little bit. So is this all like communication tech from like world war two times? It says a little bit before world war because 1945 was I don't know, man. I mean, we're, I'm discovering this with you now. I really. Didn't... This seems this seems like early tech for uh, communication, and when they're talking about crypto, not like cryptocurrency, but crypto as in communication. That's you know, with the mechanisms like... in working order, they would now take instructions and test the machines. The Phil loaded the appropriate rotors onto Adam the KP and say for Eve. Each followed their own set of instructions and then turned the bombs on. So I guess this was like early weaponry or early more. Maybe that's why it's named Secret Adam and Eve, kind of bringing it back to the beginning, mm -hmm. like the old biblical yeah. reference, which the CIA the creation and the NSA, story. Yeah, the CIA and the NSA have a lot of like and our government alone, a lot of their project names like Operation Starship Prime. There's just a bunch mm -hmm. of weird kind of crazy names you don't really understand what they're doing but they have a lot of biblical references inside of them yeah i'm, I'm kind of curious about how old those agencies are because the nsa I, I mean aren't they more of a modern intelligence agency i didn't i didn't know they existed back in the world war ii years i mean they're the secret ones i mean the cia was not supposed to and that's the next one we'll read after this but this part here over the course of the war 121 u.s navy crypto analytic bombs would be built by the navy personnel at dayton's national cash register company and shipped to the navy's communication annex in washington dc machinist first class boccio boccino was told later after being transferred to Washington, D.C. in September 1943 that the settings originally found by Adam resulted in decrypting a crucial Enigma message. The message gave the location of a German refueling submarine, a milk cow. This allowed the Navy to target and sink the U-tanker and three submarines that were trying to refuel. It was the first of such messages broken by the bombs as the United States waged its war against milk cows by sinking and refueling subs. Germany was forced to keep their attack U-boats closer to shore and shorten their time at see despite the 50,000 per machine price tag they the more they even paid for themselves the bombs routinely found the rotor and plug positions for the german cryptologic workhorse the cipher machine called enigma knowing the daily settings for a machine allowed the u.s and its allies to decipher virtually every intercepted enigma and ciphered message sent by the different german services so i'm guessing this was a giant tactic to during the war to stop germany from transmitting messages and being able to refuel their u-boats yeah yeah, that's what it sounds like. They call them milk about. cows. <laughs> so there was this one, but the one I read is a little bit different. So the Adam and Eve mm -hmm. story, but the secret. So I'm just going to click into the secret teachings of the all age yeah. index. So this is on the CIA website up there. You see it at the top CIA website. Mm -hmm. um, it's 600 something pages. So I'm not going to obviously go through them all, but I just want to read you what the context say. So the context in the CIA websites article says title page, preference, table of contents, introduction, the ancient mysteries and secret societies, which have influenced modern Mas Masonic <laughs> symbolism, the ancient mis uh, mysteries and secret societies, part two, the ancient mis uh, mysteries and secret societies, part three, Atlantis. And the gods <laughs> of antiquity, the life and teachings of Thom Herms. And I mean, just I, what the hell? Like, you know what yeah, I'm what saying? What is this? So yeah. I thought this was weird. So I clicked out of it. Now there's the Adam and Eve story that is actually on the CIA website, which is the full document. The Adam and Eve story, you see it's got, what does that say up mm -hmm. top? Declassified in part, sanitized, copy, approved for release 2013, 624. Let me mm -hmm. just... Okay, so it's it's the Earth. You see the Earth core in like a plane drawing, right? Um, you go down a little bit deeper. This starts leading into the Younger Dryas theory, which I don't know if you know what that is, but about the Earth resetting. And this is actually not the first time civilization has built this far, but it's been on top of resets and resets and resets and resets. Why does mm -hmm. the CIA have an article talking about this? Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I mean, I'm going to scroll down a little bit because it's a little bit, it's a lot to read, but wow. I mean, they have a thing called yeah, the new fluke. Mm -hmm. We're on our way. Great Britain. Just for people listening, Where, we're looking what's at a the lot date? of what's the date on this clay. Thing? What are we talking 66. about? 1966. It looks like this thing was published. That's Cassius clay. Nelson it's so Rock weird. There's a, a there's a lot of culture 
uh, references in this document. Curious about that author, though. So the contents of it, the next cataclysm is page one. The Great Floods is page seven. The story, page 19. The event, 29. Genesis, 35. Conclusion is 45. Why it's would... Like, it's like they're taking all of these uh, historical moments, or in this case, some biblical moments, and trying to relate it to what was going on in the 1960s or so. Read that right is there. It, yeah, now Noah's Ark 6,500 uh, years ago, like Adam and Eve, 11,500, this too will come to pass. They're trying to talk about history repeating itself. In California, the mountains shake like ferns in a breeze. The mighty Pacific rears back and piles up into a mountain of water more than two miles high, then starts its race eastward. With the force of a thousand armies, the wind attacks, ripping, shre uh, shredding everything in a supersonic bombardment. The unbelievable mountain of Pacific seawater follows the wind eastward, buying Los Angeles and San Francisco as if they were but grains of sand. Nothing but nothing stops the relentless, overwhelming onslaught of wind and ocean. Across the continent, the thousand mile per hour wind wreaks its unholy vengeance everywhere. Mercifully, un unceasingly, every living thing is ripped into shreds while being blown across the countryside. And the earthquake leaves no place untouched. In many places, the earth's molten sublayer breaks through and spreads a sea of white hot liquid fire to add to the Holocaust. Within three hours, the fantastic wall of water moves across the continent burying the wind-savaged land under two miles of seething water coast to coast. In a fraction of a day, all vestiges of civilization are gone, and the great cities Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, New York are nothing but legends. Barely a stone is left where millions walked just a few hours before. Whoa. <laughs> That's modern language, though, for talking about Los Angeles, San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, Chicago, Dallas, modern civilizations – where it's talking about another reset. Do you think that this is there? Because this was, it looks like it was a 1966. Do you think that they were sort of forecasting uh, like nuclear uh, war and this being part of a reset, like, you know, previous societies? What is it so out of the realm? And obviously we're just speculating now, but is this yeah. maybe what they were warning so much about climate change? Was that the fear of this that was going to happen? I haven't heard any anything that would have to do with, uh, you know, weather per se, although. It says, you once know, more, talking about the earth has shifted its 60 mile thick shell with the poles moving um, um, almost to the equator in a fraction of a day. Again, the atmosphere and oceans refusing to change direction with the earth shell have wiped out almost all life. After this tumble, mm -hmm. we join Noah, Adam and Eve, Atlantis, Mu and Olympus and Jesus joins Osiris, Tazara, Zeus and so I don't understand why they're mm -hmm. unless they're actual people that are named after that or they're code names for government projects because there would have been no Los Angeles when Noah was around. This is very weird. Noah, Adam, and Eve, Vinshu, Osiris, what do they have in common? They represent era ages apart, and yet somehow they all join hands in the next cataclysm and walk with us. There are others who walk with us too, men of science, long forgotten, those who first saw that these tumbles, these cataclysms, cataclysmic catastrophes or revolutions of the earth shells have happened before countless times j ander de luck in 1779 and george george's cuvier in 1812 were the foremost dolomiel the famous mineralogist joined the consensus as did escher and forel the swiss geologists also j ander de luck jr and von buke they all agreed that the cataclysms were caused by sudden revolutions of the surface of the earth theory so, of the earth first published in 1812 yeah and they were referencing uh, uh earthquakes in the earlier i'm just wondering if this is like the prediction of people just kind of understanding that the earth might be a younger driest theory i mean that's one of the most looked down theories of all time is the younger driest theory um mostly because it just there's not a whole lot of scientific evidence but obviously if they didn't give you that information or they chose not to let you have those types of things um mm -hmm. It's very, very scary, man. But it's just, to, to me, I just, I don't know. I, I, maybe this isn't important to the podcast. Maybe this isn't something co funny or cool to talk about. But it just was very, very eerie where it made kind of like my arm hairs stand up a little bit. And it's a 57 page article. Um, so I'm not going to go full, into especially it. coming from uh, government websites. 
Yeah, I mean, they're both registered. We have the NSA.gov right there. Then we have the mm -hmm. CIA.gov right there. And it's the Adam and Eve stories, apparently the history of cataclysm. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they have a lot of weird shit on there. If you just look at well, the you know, website, there's, uh, you know, this news about China and their their hypersonic missile and it being able to carry nukes. And, you know, I think, you know, I'm I'm as old as I am. I'm still too young to remember any of the stuff from the 60s about you know russia and and the us and cuba and all the nuclear scares you know has someone i can't remember someone was telling me the other day they're like yeah we're the generation of of school shootings and having to do lockdown drills and you're the generation of of um of uh you know hiding in bunkers <laughs> even though i'm not that old but like the idea that that there's the scare of, of nuclear, you know, Holocaust back in the, in the sixties. And do you think we might go that direction? Now we have way more, we have so many weapons that could easily take out a nuke in a matter of a second before it even landed into our atmosphere. That means all electronics would have to go down. My mm -hmm. total kind of threat or my only kind of worry about our country or any countries out there really will be the whole idea of decentralization, which Yuri Beskamenov, um, which I played on a recent one before or a podcast in the past with my buddy Brandon mm -hmm. talking about decentralizing by brainwashing a whole generation. This is the longest slow play I've ever seen. Now, I've been worried about China long before everyone else was worried about it. But I think the problems are still happening. Just the times have shifted. I mean, in 19, whenever JFK was presidency, there was a plan called Operation um Northwoods, I think it was, which was like they were going to fake blow up a jetliner with a bunch of fake bodies on it and let all the reporters talk about how there's this jetliner that blew up all that it was an attack from Cuba so he could go over there and invade. I mean, recently, uh -huh. Obama, there were speculations about Obama being arrested because of uh, what was that? Uh, they gave a bunch of weapons to I forgot who it was. Um, let me see. Was it the Fast and Furious? Yes, deal? the Fast and Furious deal. Mm -hmm. Ted Nugent was talking about on. um yeah joe rogan i don't know if you know a whole lot about yeah that. yeah sent off uh u.s sent off a bunch of weapons uh that were sort of tagged um serialized and known so that they could track where they um where they would go turns out that a lot of those weapons were used in 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 murders and ended up back in the united states and gangs and and uh ended up being this this big deal and uh, uh no one ever really got in trouble for it yeah, because they covered their ass. They had the media switch the guns that were found, like tell them like, hey, it's not this gun. It's this gun. And it wasn't that gun. It was the gun they originally thought it was. But they were given wrong information, which they spread out to the people to go. Well, we don't make those guns. That's from another country, which already mm -hmm. starts decentralization again with wrong information where you start wondering what the hell is shit's going to go to. I mean, I find it fascinating right now because um, that podcast with Ted Nugent, he was talking about I don't really his personality is a little bit much. But <laughs> he says some yeah. good points where even him and Joe kind of talked about like an aspect of like the president used to be someone that was like kind of a voice for the people, but the people controlled the president. He worked for the people. Now it's the opposite way around where we work for the president, like the president, they make a rule, you follow it. I mean, a lot of people didn't realize, but this mandate OSHA stepped up and said, you can't mm -hmm. do that. That's unconstitutional. Now he's only suggesting getting it where you start to realize mm. your rights almost just got thrown out the fucking window. But when did the divisiveness switch? When did it go from people worried and trying to take care of themselves to now people monitoring other people in fear that it's going to hurt them? Like it was this weird kind of slow switch that happened before it was about making sure you're safe, making sure this is safe. Now it's like, I got to police everyone around me. And it's that decentralization it seems aspect. Yeah, it's weird because it seems to me like it's um, just a larger scale version of like tribalism. I mean, humans are naturally drawn to groups of, you know, like minded people, similar, you know, either personalities, desires, uh, hobbies, sports, whatever it is. And uh, I think we're kind of in a weird spot in the US where this sort of tribalism this being drawn towards these groups is actually much, much larger groups. And I think it's getting so divisive that that these these groups are really starting to try and dictate public policy against the other groups. Uh, I think, you know, it's interesting with Ted Nugent, 
you know, and Joe Rogan, Ted Nugent's very right leaning and Joe is much more, more, I would say center because he still has a lot of, you know, a lot of thoughts on, on free market and, uh, you know, personal freedom, some libertarian stances. Um, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen that podcast or listened to that podcast. It'd be interesting to go back and, and listen because I think those two personalities and those two perspectives I'm sure that there's some commonalities in there that should be more um, concerned for the rest of the population. But I, I think things are starting to kind of drift in some weird directions, even just looking um, not just in America, but like Australia, you know, and how, how the government's trying to control everything, um, you know, with, with COVID restrictions and lockdowns and these COVID camps and, and that sort of thing. It seems like we have the same, characters in the United States that are doing very similar things. It's just, we have certain things like the constitution in place that really does put some restrictions on government control where Australia, they, they don't. I, um, first of all, I love it. It's like the last 10 before a thousand. We're still diving right into the politics. How are you doing? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to kick <laughs> us off into some weird loophole right in the beginning. <laughs> um, that might've been nothing. I just thought it was interesting. Uh, it they, is. They have stuff like that. But when it comes to I think a lot of this is like, for for instance, now, Ted Nugent, he seems like obviously a right hard right person and just all guns and does whatever he wants. Seems crazy. Hearing him talk is just a little bit different. And it's much like I've discovered through doing this show, like nobody's really like how they are on like social media it might be an appearance or it might be how someone's getting them to look. He brought up a good point, which I know the media has lied about a bunch of stuff, calling Russia, uh, Trump a Russian spy, calling Tulsi Gabbard a Russian spy. That was never fucking proven. Even. um yeah. Yeah. ted nugent for instance had a claim onto him which talked about the fact of that the media said that he adopted an underage girl to have sex with and he was like what underage girl like who when why, why am i not understand what, what why am i not getting any of this if it involves me and you start to realize like they just make up a bunch of lies and sadly their audience will follow them wherever they go it's just so like that's the issue with joe rogan i think why he's getting a lot of shit for everything that he mm -hmm. does is because he's not following their narrative and they're all pissed off um because it's a competitive aspect i mean he has 11 million following they have 500,000 at the most CNN does, 400,000 on MSNBC and other corporations where you start getting to this point of like, now it's the best time to really kind of check all your sources and stuff. And I mean, for me, I've just studied, like I've checked the Freedom of Information Act website. That's what I do in my fucking free time. I mean, CIA website as well too. Mostly because you come across something really interesting where it's like, they should make a movie about this. Like there was um a, a fighter pilot back in like World War One or forgot when it was when they were there was a bunch of bombings that were going on he fell out of his fucking airplane and he fell onto a wing of another fucking airplane and he survived not by like piloting the airplane down by just like fucking hanging on while the person that was flying that airplane was dead or some shit like that it's a crazy fucking story I'm like, <laughs> where is this at like where is this information i mean it's the same thing with night witches in russia they just don't choose to I kind of I, I mean in Russia that their whole thing is like there's a they do like a parade for airplanes or something like that and the most famous I would say would probably be night witches which is a group of women who stepped up during World War II um, to fight basically the Nazis and bomb them in the middle of the night in Russia in December or freezing cold weather um, in mm. open crop dusting airplanes so you're freezing your ass off in Russia and the you know how cold it gets over there and yeah. it's the middle of the night. And they're bombing oh. Nazi soldiers all because they're stepping up to defend their country, but they don't get into the parade because they don't are they're not recognized as mm -hmm. uh, Russian forces. They want to show the giant planes, not crop dusting ones. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. you're missing a whole piece of history. I mean, I think there needs to be, especially in the the realm of movie making, for instance, capturing more realistic things rather than going so Hollywood. I think a lot of times now is that even when something as crazy as that shit that we just read, it seems like a Hollywood mm -hmm. fucking movie of like, oh my God, they're doing like Adam and Eve shit, or they have maybe a, a interesting name for projects, but make mm -hmm. it more realistic. So when a conspiracy or an idea does come out there, like the fact that people think a conspiracy is that they, they told you not to get this certain type of mask so they would save them for hospital workers. That's labeled a conspiracy to a lot of people, even though they publicly said that's why they did it, like to make sure that mm -hmm. the hospital workers have more N95 masks. You start getting to this point, too much Hollywood might have brainwashed us for some people that might 
dive on to the crazy end. We might say something outrageous. Alex Jones is probably the best example, uh, mostly for one incident out of everything he's gotten fucking right. He did say something that is of importance is that when you read those government articles, you notice how a lot of those brought up past names. He goes, that's how they do it when they do anything. They bring up, whether it's a weird article or whether it's some type of document or some type of project that they're doing, they use code names for older style things. It might base in some similarities, but it's in case you're reading it, it seems like a science fiction or it seems some type of religious novel or something. It doesn't make sense, much like we're reading that. And it sounded like a fucking sci-fi movie. It doesn't sound like anything that is possible today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we live in a world with access to tons of information. And, uh, you know, even 20 years ago where we get what people gave us um, from the limited sources that we had. Now there's so many different sources and, you know, you're talking about freedom of information act and finding stuff on their, on the site. It's like uh, now there's a ton more people who are interested in looking for that stuff and bringing it to light. Now we have all these, you know, platforms like, you know, like the podcast, it's like, now tons of people can talk about these things and bring you know a little bit more information to the the general public yeah but then that also then begs the question how much of it's true and i kind of lean towards that a lot of folks are not even diving far enough into it to know what's actually true you know the the idea that you're sending out tweets with bad information and then uh, someone calls them out on it and no one, and nothing gets redacted. And if it does, then, you know, well, it's like, oh, here's another <laughs> it, one. it gets to the point where a lot of bad information is out. Here's another one that we'll look up. Um, this one was, I put on my Twitter, but I don't think, uh, I don't think it only got like two likes cause nobody wants to, um, the, <laughs> you that- know, it's hard to get attention on Twitter unless you've got tons of followers already. Uh, what is it? Uh, the COVID, uh, the officials offer vaccine reassurance. So Reuters got a, um, <laughs> I, I put up this tweet. I don't, I, I think I'm going to pull up the right one. Um, but apparently they did something where they were, they were going to block the release of documents about the vaccine um, for 55 years, which obviously they do something like around 50 years, like JFK, 9-11, all this type of stuff. Um, so anybody that's involved with it is dead. So they don't have to worry about anybody getting in trouble for this type of thing. So I'm going to pull up this <laughs> article because I'm surprised. I mean, every time I'm on Twitter right now, I'm seeing Joel Olstein's trending and fucking DeSantis is trending. Like, Jesus Christ, it's the same people every <laughs> single time. Like, what the fuck? Um, sorry, I'm waiting for my Twitter to load. Mm, uh, that's funny. But I put, put up this article because it was from, I guess, Reuters is what it's called. I thought it was Reuters because the way it's spelled. But mm-hmm. um, they put up a thing. Yeah. Uh, wait, what? FDA wants 55 years to process FOIA requests over vaccines. So I'm going to pull this up on screen real quick. Hmm. So Reuters put this up there like, what? That doesn't make any fucking sense. Why would you do that? And Reuters is like the fact checking like hub for everybody, which is like whatever they say, everyone's like, that's how you know it's true or not. But I thought this was a little bit interesting. So I'm going to scroll back up to the top. Oh, I didn't want it to be a pull up web. Uh, pull up episode but it looks like I, you have to fact check with half this shit or you look like yeah a, i know a, a yeah where's job. your producer <laughs> jamie <laughs> i'm waiting for my freaking so wait what fda wants 55 why does mm-hmm. it stop giving me advertisements people um so freedom of information act requests are rarely speedy but when a group of scientists asked the federal government to share the data it replied or it relied upon in licensing pfizer's COVID 19 vaccine the response went beyond typical bureaucratic foot dragging as in 55 years (laughs) beyond that's how long the the food and drug administration and court papers this week proposes it should be given to review to release the trove of vaccine related documents responsive to the request if a federal judge in texas agrees plaintiffs public health and medical professionals for transparency you can expect to see the full record in 2076 oh i'll be fucking dead <laughs> lord willing um, um watch my life be going great around then i'm like fuck i don't want to die then 
Um, <laughs> the 1967 FOIA laws require federal agencies to respond to information requests within 20 business days. However, this time it actually takes to get the documents will vary depending on the complexity of the request and any backlog requests also pending at the agency, according to the government's central FOIA website. So, I mean, three. Well, and what information are they looking for? They want to know the data. Like that everyone keeps saying, they just want to know some of the details yeah it's not like they're looking for anything in particular they just want something to look at so that they can you know answer potentially answer some questions that apparently they're out. confidential businesses and trade secret information of pfizer of BioNTech, and personal privacy information of patients who participated in clinical trials mm -hmm. um wrote doj lawyers in a joint status report filed monday well, you know, all, all these things are so, you know, relatively new. And even though tons of people have been vaccinated, we don't have any, any data on long-term impacts, especially when it comes down to like, you know, newly vaccinated children. Does the entire purpose of the FOIA is to assure government transparency they continue? It is difficult to imagine a greater need for transparency than an immediate disclosure of the documents relied upon the FDA to license a product that is now being mandated to over 100 million Americans under penalty of losing their careers, their income, their military service status, and far worse. They also argue that Title 21 uh, subchapter F of the FDA's own regulations stipulates that the agency is to make immediately available all documents underlying licensure of a vaccine. So given the public interest in the mm -hmm. vaccine, I don't, that, that kind of makes sense though. If, uh, you know, if there's this mandate, this, you should be able to have access to the information to, you know, to see whether it's, uh, it's safe or not. I just don't think enough time has passed to really determine some of these things, you know? And then of course you got the new, uh, Omicron variant that folks are saying they're concerned about. And, um, I'm trying to figure out if someone answered that question, but I want to see someone that is mm -hmm. actually reliable, not, mm-hmm. See what Fauci's saying on it. <laughs> yeah. Most reliable guy out there. <laughs> Fuck me. Jesus, that guy's still going on about like, we're going to have to shut down and go into a yearly lock. It's an endemic. It never fucking ends. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting the, the differences in, you know, listening to the original doctor about this new variant and saying that it's so far, it's still early and, and no need to be freaked out about it. Because so far, the folks that have been impacted have been, um, you know, not suffering a whole lot, you know, body aches, potentially, um, you know, being tired. <laughs> and we're talking about, you know, restricting travel and forcing tests and, and uh, quarantines after coming back with a negative test after flying from some other country. I mean, there's you know, policy is kind of a big deal and you should be basing policy on really strong science. And I'm not seeing it based on science. I'm seeing it based on how people freak out, how, pa how panicky people are. Well, the term science is probably going to change. It's going to end up being something like, well, if you think you're right, then it's like, okay, well, I didn't know we base our decisions <laughs> off of like, you know, guessing. I thought it was more about self truth. Thinking. Well, they hijacked the term <laughs> fact checker, which I fucking hate, man. It just gets me so pissed because whenever you're trying to say something, well, it's like fact checkers say this fact checkers. They, they hijack the fact checkers. That's exactly what a conspiracy person would say. And you're like. Jesus Christ, I feel like a 9-11 denier. Whenever I try and say something now, everyone's like, that's exactly, you're just a COVID denier. I was like, I'm not denying anything about it. I'm just saying, where are you getting your fucking peer-reviewed articles? Check those yeah. fucking peers. Yeah. I want you, yeah. I want to see you on the ground, up their ass with a flashlight. Like, where the fuck are you getting your information from, you little piece of shit? <laughs> Well, I mean, think about all the those fact checkers and how people have relied on these fact checkers. But the reality is the fact checkers really aren't that great. And especially in, in some cases, um, they're actually quite wrong. But people are relying on these folks to 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 do the work for them instead of, you know, instead of people having the ability to 
you know, see that there's a red flag there and, and dive in a little bit deeper. I think people are just, people just want to get the information and go and, and then they forget about it a week later. It's like, no one really does any, any legwork to figure out what's true and, and what, what's not true, or at least dive in to find out as much evidence as you can and then determine, you know, what, what you believe about it. I mean, truth is one of those hard things. It's hard to, to figure out. I mean, science does not find truth. Science just has a bunch of evidence. And is it enough evidence to convince you um, until there's new evidence that might change your mind? It's not, I mean, finding truth is kind of a tough thing. Honestly, fuck all political parties right now because nobody's stirring up shit about the Ghislaine Maxwell trial not being open to the public. <laughs> <laughs> I should see people on the doorstep with Molotov cocktails throwing it at that fucking judge building or federal building. Being like, I want to know what's at least let me. I tried to call in on the first day, but mm -hmm. they gave out the like the code was locked and they called me later saying, Sorry, here's the new code. And it was like 7 p.m. I'm like, I'm not fucking calling back. And then I'll just get the outline at the ending and hopefully nobody misses a fucking crucial detail. Like, uh, what is it? Bill Gates sitting like Bernie Sanders with his mittens across his thing, just sitting in the courtroom, <laughs> like, bring up my name, bitch. Bring mm -hmm. up my name. Mm hmm Well, and that that story's been kind of going on for a while. You know, when the Jeffrey Epstein uh sort of documentary came out. It was hard for me to kind of get through that because it, it just pisses me off so much. You know, when, when folks are taking advantage of minors, it kind of eats at me. And for her to be his right-hand woman in that process, why aren't more people up in arms about it, you know? Yeah, you think the QAnon thing, I think maybe people just tired themselves out on the wrong pedophile. They just kind of, they bet on the wrong horse, I would say. It's just <laughs> weird because a lot, what I'm seeing with the daily uh, reviews of the trial, it's, go it's going to take six weeks, so it's going to be a while. Um, this probably end of January, we might see some like actual whatever's going to happen. But who's her lawyer is the same person, Comey. Comey's daughter is the lawyer for Ghislaine Maxwell. Really? You know who I'm talking about? Uh, Comey. I don't, I, I got to look this up, make sure I'm right about this. I hate fucking looking stuff up in a podcast, but I'm just so, <laughs> I'm still thinking about the Adam and Eve thing. But um, it, it's weird because even the pilots, I heard the pilot say, if I knew what was going on, I would have quit my job. Like none of them were mm -hmm. kind of in on what was going on. But I was like, you had to skepticize why a lot of these people were riding your fucking airplane. You know what I mean? It's not just driving yeah. and asking questions. The issue that I have right now is, is that all of Ghislaine's, uh, um, kind of problems that are happening or all the stuff that's getting brought to her attention is fucking getting pushed onto Epstein. It's like, you're pushing it on a dead guy. Yeah. So you're obviously not going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Ghislaine Maxwell lawyers. All right. Who are Ghislaine Maxwell's defense team? We got Jeffrey S. Palaguchi, Laura Menninger, two Colorado-based lawyers, Morgan and Foreman, um, Chris Everdell, a partner in the U.S. Uh, where's the – I know it's something to do with Kobe. Someone to do with one of those famous people out there. I'm going to find it. Don't you worry. You're not talking FBI Comey, are you? Yeah, that guy. Really? Jim Comey? I'm trying to find it because this is, is very important. Hmm. Where's this trial even being held? Do you know? Uh, it's being held in New York. New York. So it's Eastern so Standard some... Time. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, us folks on the Pacific Coast. What did I tell you? You guys wake up. James Comey's daughter is on yeah. Ghislaine Maxwell's thing. Yeah, interesting. Who is James Comey? I don't know. My computer, I think, just froze. Congratulations. Uh -oh. That's the fucking... Yeah, it's kind of a... I don't know. It's kind of a weird thing with, you know, the uh, Rittenhouse trial, you know, going through and getting so much attention. You, do you think this, this trial is going to be very popular or do you think people are just going to, you know, it's going to be a smaller group of people who are actually into it? No, people... It's they were During that Rittenhouse thing, it was signaling to their tribe that they give a shit because it was a race issue. Was it a race no. issue? Once a lot of people found out that he shot white people and two of the bullets that go into the crowd were pedophile or pedophiles. It's like 
you know, it's, I mean, I have a different opinion. I think that he shouldn't have been over there in the first fucking place. He obviously was just looking to be a vigilante. Um, but at the same time, I mean, the law is the law. And technically those people, he identified himself as a cop and the dude even admitted to still chasing after him. Like they were looking to fuck somebody up. I mean, there's, we all yeah. know those scenarios. We all know how the passion gets in the air. So, you know, that aside and all, I just think this is lane thing. Nobody really cares because they can't see it on television. I'm, mm -hmm. I care about it and it's fucking hard for me to stay on it. Even check the website about everything. I might as well wait till it's all over with and then get a debrief from some person in a fucking podcast talking about it. Like it doesn't, that's the thing is like, I it's when it's not televised, it's not in the moment. It's not capturing your attention out of all the times I've said, why is court fucking entertainment? They choose not to put this one on fucking Hulu. Why? <laughs> why? Out think, of all of them. Do you think that some of the, like there's going to be some bombs dropped about some celebrities and some powerful people that maybe that's the reason why some of this is not getting as much attention right now. That is one of the reasons why is that they're afraid that they're going to drop major list names and they're afraid that that might, you know, a lot, apparently a lot of them are showing up there or finding a way to be inside the courthouse with media, whether it's a phone call or not, um, just to hear what's going on. And I go that alone. I'm like, if anybody had shady dealings with that man, the yeah, A should be put on blast. Like, I don't care if it's Chris Tucker has already been identified as going there. I mean, Bill Gates was on there 27 fucking times on his flight logs. You start wow. getting on like this whole entire thing of like, whether you have money or not, you got to own up that you were friends with that guy, whether you felt like you were in a position that you just couldn't get out of, or you fear that he had way too much power. I bet you he did. But I also think he's what the wealth class fear as yeah. a man with billions of dollars but a poor mentality and poor mentality as meaning societal poor. That's what the wealth class see when they see Epstein. They go, that's why we can't give poor people money because they'll turn into an Epstein. It's like, no, that's not true. That's mm. an egomaniac or a narcissist that was Epstein. But yeah, dude, he had, there's a lot of shady workings where it makes me question more now. And just watching the narrative spin all over the news where it's like been for the longest time, the Republican and Democrats fighting back and forth and back and forth, each one calling each other racist when each of them are doing the same racist shit. I think they're both yeah. racist. I think all political parties in a sense are racist because it just means that what your idea is right and the other ideas don't matter and don't fit in. Whether it's mm -hmm. libertarian too, I'm a libertarian. I don't think the people involved in it are racist. I just think the idea of you have these sides or these tribes, I get the point of it, but I yeah. think we're in a weird spot where we have so much division in that sense. I mean, the fact is like, we're not even worried about other countries uh, inclusion into our giant corporation. All I'm seeing is Trump's memes everywhere. Biden memes everywhere. They're funny. Sure. But I don't want to deal with that shit. I don't want to see emails of, oh, apparently Tucker Carlson reached out to Hunter Biden about getting his son into Georgetown University in 2014. I don't give a fuck. What? <laughs> what, what the hell? Can we see some real shit like the fact that maybe that we have a lot of issues going on in this country? It's like, well, if people don't want to see that. They want to see the the, the dirt. I'm like, I wanted to see dirt on tabloid mag magazines when it was like, here's a Lindsay Lohan cooter shot. Or here's a Jennifer <laughs> Aniston nip slip. I don't want to see that on fucking politics, man. I want to see yeah. the real shit. Yeah. Well, it's, I think it's less about actually getting important things done. It's really just infighting, you know, one group fighting against another group to to gain power. I don't know. I, I'm bothered. Like recently, you know, they were, they were doing, uh, trying to do this, uh, this new budget and they decided you know, they're not going to shut down the government. They're going to continue on, you know, and, and revisit this, you know, in January or something. I, I can't remember the dates, but, you know, just it's like, well, wait a minute. The important aspect here is for us to look at how much debt we have and what our bills are and and the and the damage that can be done to our society if we're constantly in, increasing our debt. I mean, we're over twenty eight trillion dollars now. It's, it's ridiculous. I'm not sure what the debt calculator looks like today, but. I think we're rearing up to $29 trillion in debt. And I think China owns a lot of that. It makes me nervous. And that seems to be like an area that the general population should be interested in. But instead, you know, they're looking at all this infighting, all this, this systemic racism and, you know, all of the, the rights that all these other people need to have and not realizing that a lot of people already have a lot of these rights but we're going to make a big deal out of it and distract from really the long-term issues that I think debt is a massive one, but they're not even addressing it.
or who uses what drug to get over COVID or who uses yeah. – nobody's carrying a fact of people getting – Dana White just got over it. I mean, he listened to Joe yeah. Rogan. doesn't mean that you should get your medical advice from Joe Rogan or Aaron Rodgers or whoever. But you mm-hmm. need to understand is that there's not just one cure for all, and the thing is not even a cure. It's a thing it, – you know, if you get your first and second shot, you're not technically considered vaccinated. You have to have the booster, and then you have to have – it's like what by the 12th booster – like when do you, when your face starts sinking down? Maybe yeah. I don't know. Like I, at this point, yeah, what like, I'm just like, just give me the booster shots. Like you haven't even got your first and second. Well, the fucking all oh, they count the booster only. So like fucking just suck that yeah, stick just give me the boost. <laughs> jack me up. Yeah. Well, I I'm kind of curious about like they were saying that you know you should get boosted after six months, and then I heard some I think it was NIH um, doctor said yeah it, it actually might be more like three. I'm like what what are you what are you talking about? You know, how about natural immunity? What if you've already had COVID? What what then are you looking at? And this What's, is what we can't talk about because YouTube will flag the shit out of it. I know. Can you believe that? It's well, like they're going to update their services. About it. They're updating their services January 5th, which is ironic because January 6th. But they're doing new terms and conditions yeah. where yeah, um, I saw that. You're, they're going to probably do free advertising on your videos, no matter if you're monetized or not. They're going to find it any single way possible to make sure it's way more regulated than it is right now. We already probably think that it's enough. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's scary because then that trending hashtag of Section 230, which is that giant censorship ban online, um, mm-hmm. that's going to really affect a lot of people, especially make the content creation game a lot harder. And I mean, I'm pro for it if it works in the way I want it to work which is that I really honestly hope if it's going to eliminate all outside sources of media, that's going to hold a bigger candle to these number networks or these letter networks that have been looked on for so long as being more accountable for the things that they say. The reason why they don't give a fuck what narrative they spin now, it's all about fitting their audience is because they don't really have an increase in numbers. It's the same audience over and over again. Joe Rogan having 11 million, these people having 500,000, 400,000 people that watch their network. At mm-hmm. this point, it's like, I'm going to – whatever keeps my audience around. No, yeah. you got if you were the only ones around, you would have more – there was no Howard Stern if there was none of that shit. Hell, I'm all right with radio going back to like Opie and Anthony days where there was like people eating s- chicken subs and fighting in a giant mosh pit of spaghetti and on air. I don't give a fuck about that. That's fine. But that means these networks actually have to start doing the news again, not just saying things because it fits their narrative. This is how we get into a society on the verge of collapse. I'm not saying we might be on the verge of collapse. I'm just saying our priorities are way fucking off, man. Like we're in a weird fucking state where people can't get over the vaccine talk. People can't get over the politics talk. I'm seeing it fucking everywhere. I don't care Mm -hmm. whether you are or not. This it's, it makes it more difficult. Even if I'm going to continue after a thousand where I don't really want to do it. Because it's just fucking annoying as shit all over social media is that I'm so much happier when I'm off of it. I think people are much more happier off of it. But then the people that have the common sense to get off of it, the people that keep spinning that narrative that we all hate, stay the fuck on it because now their space is filled with everyone that agrees with their narrative. I'm like, I fucking. Yeah, there's no there's no opposition to it. Well. Uh, kind of talking about YouTube. I've been trying to learn a little bit more about YouTube. I I've been like my my coaching channel. I just subscribed the other you know, day. I, what's that? I just subscribed to your podcast on there the other day. I oh yeah, to yeah, yeah, Apple. yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you for subscribing. <laughs> so I've been learning a little bit more about about YouTube. I, I've been posting on there for like my coaching channel for a number of years, and I haven't since the pandemic hit. Uh, just as my attention has gone other places, but, um, you know, the, the amount of attention I get on the coaching side is, is pretty frequent. There's a fair amount of people who are commenting and and engaging. And so the channel continues to grow, even though I haven't posted in a couple of years, uh, on like the podcast channel, it's, I mean, there's very, very few of, of us who are subscribed to the channel, but looking at how the algorithm promotes the videos, And then, of course, you start talking about COVID and there's a bunch of censoring that goes on. They tag you. My coaching channel, I think I'm right around maybe like 4,000 or so subscribers on there. Um, I'm not sure how many watch hours I have, but I haven't met the threshold to monetize my coaching videos. Yet YouTube has monetized all of my coaching videos. So they're running advertisements over the top of my videos, which is really annoying because... 
early on, I made a decision not to monetize my videos because I found it was very intrusive and was very annoying to people who are learning, you know, how to throw the javelin and they get interrupted by these different ads and it covers up, you know, certain aspects of the screen. It's very frustrating. Well, on a platform where you want to monetize, you know, like eventually I'd love to monetize um, the, the podcast channel, but up until that point, they're going to be throwing advertisements on it anyway. And it, to me, it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, what happened to our sort of our freedom to not have ads in our, in our programming? And, you know, how is it that even though we haven't, hit the threshold suddenly they as the platform should be able to you know throw their stuff all over our our you know our content i don't it's frustrating to me um because i think it's intrusive and especially when you start getting advertisements that are like for instance you get an advertiser that approaches you you want to believe in their product or their service and support whatever it is that they're, that they're going to advertise on your show. YouTube is going to throw a whole bunch of just different stuff on there, even though you may on the, on the, on the video be completely opposed to whatever that type of advertisement might be. Um, it's, I don't know. I, I kind of find it offensive. I, um, I used to, I, I talked about a little while ago and I kind of see the counter end of it now, which is the fact that this is the first time probably in ever of history that people have been so willing to throw money at something that they just want to support and want to watch. This is like pro the perfect time for a Patreon page. It's pro perfect yeah. time for any of this type of stuff. The issue with that is much like I talked about, or I dealt with in the beginning is that if someone puts money into your show, now they feel like they have control of a piece of that show. It's like they have a share that now messes with your flow that messes with who you are and what your show is. It's like um, when I was going to do before I did this, I was going to do radio. But then my dad, when he was trying to get me into it, he's like, yeah, you just have to say these types of things. I'm like, well, I don't get my own personal show. He's like, no, you don't have a personal show. What are you talking about? You got to kind of follow the rules we all follow. And I'm like, but it would stop me from being me. So I might as well just try the podcast thing out. And then I've just done that and stuck with it. And it's whatever I want it to be. If I want to talk about politics and episode, if I want to talk whatever I want, I want to talk about or whatever the guest wants to talk about. But imagine how like I don't mind if mid roll ads. Sure. But after like 50 or 60, when I'm listening to a podcast, even with Joe Rogan, I'm trying to work out. I'm listening. He's got 10 butcher box ads. I'm like, all right, fuck this. And it just pisses Mm -hmm. you off to a point because it messes with the flow of that. I get it. It's money. But that's the thing is when it starts with one ad, two ads, then next thing you know, you don't give a fuck about the people anymore. You just care about the advertisements. YouTube in the beginning, which is like if you look at all those old tutorial videos, and I know your uh, uh, your javelin video has gotten a lot of views on it, is because they're probably going to get more views now on a concept of there are a lot of people out there who don't have parents at home to teach them basic functions of things. Like I saw my um, uncle put up a picture on Facebook. He retweeted. He goes, this is, it was, it was a, it was like a diagram explaining all the lights in your car that go on. And he goes, just in case, cause I know someone out there doesn't have a dad who taught them this, or doesn't have a mom who taught them this. That's what YouTube in the beginning was all tutorials, all how to's all this. And you look at those videos. Now they might've been up there for 10 years, but they get a lot of views more now because kids don't know how to do these basic functions. I think that's important as well too. But when they put the main brackets on YouTube as for everyone, YouTube, the beginning says gaming, gaming, reaction, music, Twitch stream, all these types of things where it's like, man, YouTube used to be a place where people could get information, learn something. One of someone I um, had on the podcast does a whole podcast or YouTube channel about Plato. We're just going through old quotes that you would have never heard of. That's mm. interesting to me because it's new shit. It's information. That's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but the whole thing is, has been dumbed down to a point of here's a call of duty. Shut the fuck up. Here's a soda. Shut the fuck up. That's all it is now. And it's you're seeing that leak in through society on everything now where people rather take to Twitter than take to the skies. Like it's it's interesting, but it's kind of very scary because it's much more like the Wally scenario every single day where there's going to be people on giant beds that just float around, never wanting Mm -hmm. to move this multiverse thing. Have you ever seen virtual reality before? 
Mm-hmm. Yep. When you experience that or the metaverse in virtual reality, you're making it very, very fun to where people don't really feel the need to go do actual things, which makes it easier for these types of government issues to go around. Like, I really recommend the Ted Nugent podcast. He does play music for like an hour in the middle. You just got to skip through that shit. He is very good. He's very (laughs) talented. He's talented. Yeah. When he starts going, like when he goes on a political thing, I can't just switch over to music real quick. I have to listen to the political stuff and then go back to the music thing. Um, (laughs) But he starts talking about like the big vegan argument. Like people say like, I'm vegan. You got to be vegan because you're a meat killer and you're causing global warming by having all these cows. Well, did you know to make one crop grow on a certain piece of land, you have to tear up all that wildlife that's in that area? That means bunnies, rabbits, mice. There was a guy who did a study on this talking about nobody talks about the slaughter of all the innocent animals that live on that farmscape. Also, you can grow just soy there. That means plant life and animal life. They don't know. A lot of people don't know about that who are vegan. They go, what? Are you serious? Yes. They don't know. Nothing's ever free. Everything costs something. But what are you willing to risk and what are you willing to lose when it doesn't pan out the way that you want it to? Or if you get your slice of pie, there's a little bit of that end where it's like, fuck, it's Apple, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of hard because, I, you know, being a libertarian, I kind of think, you know, people's individual choices is kind of their own individual choices. And so I don't really... I don't really care too much about other people's choices as long as it doesn't have some major impact on me that I'm uncomfortable with or or against. Um, I just, you know, for me, vegan or meat eater or, or you know, someplace in between, um, and it doesn't really matter. I'm not I'm not looking at it from the perspective of you know environmental impact, although I do care. Um, I'm just thinking that a lot of people are making it such a, a political issue, but there's, you're right. There's always a cost. There's always an exchange um, for one thing to the other. And that's just the, well, that's really the reality that we, that we live in. Um, I was thinking about like the, I really you know, hope I didn't the... hijack your episode. I'm so sorry. I know you, last time we talked, you were talking about like religious and you're getting into the Scientology. Oh. <laughs> I completely just put us on a weird track with the beginning. I'm so sorry, man. If there's anything oh, on your no. mind, bring it up. No. I have nothing on my mind. Okay. <laughs> Same. Thank God. Uh, yeah. It's... No, this is this is like my relaxation, just chilling conversation time. <laughs> Perfect. I don't have to have anything prepped. That's all I wanted my show to aspire to be is that just nothing but well, having fun. You, you were, I mean, you were right around that 1000 episode, um, aren't you? Yeah, this will probably what, be towards the ending, like the last five. What's, what's your plans for the 1001 and beyond? There's no 1001. <laughs> it's <laughs> 1000. That's fucking it. <laughs> Packing it up. I could shoot all the birds out of the queue. Now I'm, I'm going to take a break for a little while. Then I'll probably end mm-hmm. up maybe, I don't know at this point right now, I don't really feel like coming back. Um, mm-hmm. Just but what do you want to do with your time? I mean, it's going to free up. I mean, you podcast a ton. What are you going to do with your time? I want to get back into bodybuilding again. Really? Yeah. Become like an underwear model or something? Working out twice a day, fucking eight hours of cardio, all that shit. All the fun stuff that's like, it makes that, <laughs> uh, that dopamine rush burn into your fucking head. You're like, yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like a heavy metal. like. Dun, 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 dun. Um, yeah. I don't know. Honestly, I, right now, what I'm focusing on is what I have in front of me. And that's still the podcast. That's that. I definitely want to take mm-hmm. a break. I'm probably going to revamp the studio and I'm going to see if I can get that vibe going. Cause man, I'm the type of person. Once I do something, um, I have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. If I take that day off, I start not wanting to do it anymore. And then that's kind of like the whole thing. So if I give myself like a month, if I give whatever long until I come back, Hey, Maybe I, this episode goes up. People think, oh, all right, he's done it a thousand next couple of days. I might end up coming back after that. I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. But there's a needs to be a break. It needs to be a thought through. It needs to be this whole entire thing. And right now there's just a lot of talk about politics. So I'm willing to just get it out and then hopefully come back. but not worried so much about it, which I think it's just going to keep ramping up and ramping up and ramping up. So, so when did, when did you start your podcast? Oh, 2018. Okay. Like uh, so you've been doing September it for a few years. 20, yeah, three and a half years. Well, the beginning wasn't every day. The beginning for the first like 70 or 80 was in person. So they were mm-hmm. once maybe every week or so. And then wow. my other podcast. I, I got to go back through your archives. I got to see some of your early stuff. It's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> well, Dave, Dave and I just hit one year. And uh, we, well, thank you. It, 
you know, because we started off kind of thinking it was just going to be a conversational thing and just hit record and, and go on. And we thought, you know, at least initially, let's just try and figure out how to do it. You know, neither of us have ever done anything like it before. And, and, you know, we just have inter interesting conversations. So that's what we thought we would do. And we've kind of taken this first year figuring out how to navigate podcasting. And there are so many challenges in podcasting that is for sure. But we just hit the mark of, of a year and we recorded just this last weekend. In fact, um, sort of a, was it 88? I don't know. What's that? Episode 88 or no, uh, episode 52, one year. So one, Where one episode a week. From? Yeah. And, uh, and cause we have like, we'll post multiple, um, like a shortened version of, uh, the podcast. So there's really kind of like doubling up the number of, uh, episodes that we post, but really we've recorded one every single week. And so we did kind of like a highlight show, just kind of a reminisce, you know, and go back and watch some of the old stuff. And it's, it's kind of, I, for me, it's kind of important to go back and see some of the early stuff and, and, and see where you've come and, and make sure that you're doing things to continually improve. And I think we're going to shoot for another, another year, which I'm kind of excited about because I'm kind of now getting into the rhythm of, of doing the podcast and enjoying it. I enjoy doing, you know, some research and, figuring out a way to kind of present it to people. But as you know, it, podcasting can take a lot of your time. I mean, there's a, a commitment and depending on how much you want to do in the background, you know, we were talking about YouTube and Twitter and that sort of thing. It is hard to kind of get any traction in on those platforms and their algorithms really are not great for, for beginner people, you know, who, who are just kind of getting started. Uh, it's, it takes a while to get tra traction. TJ from Skinwalker Ranch was the one that probably told me the best. He told me off air. He's like, you just need someone to get see one of your videos and get you out there. Or the best thing is that you got to wait until that algorithm just tricks you up and launches you to the top. He goes, because once, I mean, I've heard the interviews with Snoop Dogg on Joe Rogan. I've heard everyone talk about it like, man, once I was doing me, it, then it just happened. It all came together. It was like, no, you were doing you for a while. It's just about when did that trickle finally start? Because once you see that like attention start happening, it just keeps funneling and funneling your direction because they realize now they can try and find a way to milk you, much like those uh, machines they were talking about in the beginning. They, yeah. you, it's about finding that trick to get up there. It's just about when and where. I mean, Spotify when it wrapped for me just this year alone was over twenty one thousand minutes of content that was put up in the year alone and i'm like jesus christ yeah. like that's a i mean if you took all my years or all my episodes of podcasting it's a full year of just non-stop talking like there's going to be a clone out there that's probably going to come and kill me one day but <laughs> whatever um <laughs> it's definitely an interesting feeling but i think like i mean i'm at what half a million plays in a uh, what in a, um, uh, a thousand episodes that's only going to keep increasing the number is going to keep going up when who's to say f three years from now four years ago like my tarot card reader that told me in 2024 it's going to be huge <laughs> I, whether it is or not i don't know um because i said i was like i don't want to live past 26 it's like a joke and then i count from i'm 23 now three years from now is 2024 i'm 26 <laughs> what um this is not good this is not good <laughs> yeah it's uh but i think i mean if someone comes across it the next you know it starts getting a bunch more views the number of listens is only going to keep going up subscribers will only keep going up i got a list of content out there to go up there but he's TJ said to me, he goes, now, if one of your videos gets monetized, let's say $5, you have a thousand videos. So a thousand times five, $5,000. And then you go, you make that what monthly, you know, like you start getting this aspect of like, and that number just keeps going up and up and up. So he goes, it's not about getting it now, but if you have the amount of, like for me, for instance, if I was going to be smart with the way I did my show, I wouldn't be reaching out to regular people. I'd be reaching out to fucking famous people 24 seven mm -hmm. to jack my subscribers up, but I'm in it for the long haul, man. That long haul of like, okay, someone clicks on your profile. Holy, she's got a lot of people to talk to. You just start scrolling through their whole catalog. It's necessarily not like for me, it wasn't about getting the famous people. It's about talking to the people I wanted to talk to, having more interesting conversations where it might be a slow game. Maybe 15 years from now, I'll start making a buck from it. I don't know, but it's there. Now I can go do whatever I want to do if I want to stop doing podcasting and it'll always still be there. Still until either, yeah. the internet and the world go to shit. Do you think that you uh, have grown quite a bit personally through oh, this yeah. process? If you listen to yeah. me in the beginning, I sound like a 
pretentious little bastard. Um, <laughs> mostly because I'm like trying so hard to like think deeply and everyone's like, no, you just, you, you're, you're still the same person. You just are better at conversation. I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's true too. I also, my thoughts back then were different than the ones that are now. I mean, one of my podcasts three years ago didn't, doesn't age well, but nobody realizes in that three years, we've all changed so fast where it's like the whole society has shifted to where, you know, it's a completely different time you couldn't even recognize back then like i would talk about rush hour rush hour is like a banned movie where they have to put a disclaimer in the beginning of the movie on hulu now saying this is a cop comedy movie it probably doesn't age well so don't go into <laughs> it thinking like how you do now they say that on no. the video now yeah it's like disney doing the same thing it's yeah. it you start realizing you, it's like you just grow do you do pretty much everything on your own with the podcast do you get any support from other outside folks I've had a couple of people try and get guests, but I've never, I mean, maybe one or two um, mm -hmm. that I've been connected with, but it's, I, that's the only hard process that's probably deterring me from wanting to go back. It's just too hard to reach out to guests every single day. Like it's just yeah. difficult. Yeah. You kind of need a, a, a booking agent, someone to find the talent and, and bring them on the show for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I recruited uh, my son to, kind of help produce the show and and he runs the audio um he looks up stuff he cues up you know audio and video content during the show and 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 for me it's kind of fun i, I mean dave and i tease him a lot during the show because he takes it well but for me there's there's a certain aspect of of needing that additional side support you know, I, I don't know that i would be able to do a podcast like you on my own 100 percent. i just think that the the reward in that is is probably difficult to find when you've got some support from other folks. There's some, you know, they can kind of ease some of the pressure sometimes, I think. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're all new to this. This is, a, we're, we're all learning how to do this at the same time. It's not like I had some professional person come in and show me how to even do it. You know, everything that is the show today has been learned along the way, you know? I usually try and deflect when it starts getting personal like this, when it starts talking about this, <laughs> I, my buddy, gives hey, me, my buddy, Mark, a thousand, a thousand episodes. Come yeah. on. It's gotta be a little bit about you. My buddy, Mark, um, he's the biggest, like his episode was just recently. It was like two and a half hours, but he always was trying to bring it back to me and I keep shooting it off in another direction. He goes, yeah. well, people want to hear about you. I was like, well, in the beginning, yeah. nobody wanted to hear from me. They want to hear from the, <laughs> just, I built up for so long, not talking about me that whole lot, mm -hmm. unless it's a relatable thing, but I think you find value. And, and I, especially recently for me, questioning a lot of my own existence, um, really, what am I meant to do? What am I feeling? I always feel like I'm meant to do like content creation is definitely something I love to fucking do. But where I found value was I wanted billions of people to listen. And then it's like, I find value in the fact that when I was making this film, which you're going to be a part of, of course, um, I have a part with the shadow government I need you for. <laughs> um, <laughs> but my buddy who's voicing over my parts and I'm sending him clips of like, you know, when me and you record, it'll be like a three or four minute clip that I'll put into the movie, but I have someone voice over my parts or something. He's looking at it and he's like sending me a message. Like, I'm so grateful to be a part of this. Thank you so much. Cause I see the joy in all these people who are willing to accept just doing a film without any context behind it all because they know you and they trust you. He goes, that's something pretty fucking special. And I'm like, you know, that is, you know, I got a lot of messages coming up to the 1000 mark where it was like, yeah, and it hasn't fully hit me. I think I'm getting there where it's like you kind of realize someone in your family just died. You're like, oh, my God, it's now starting to hit me a month later. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. This is kind of getting to that point for me where it's like I'm starting to realize it. But it's a it's just anyone can do anything that they want to do. It's just are you willing to put the time and effort to do so? I don't sleep, so I'll use my energy on a getting podcast guests or getting whatever but you gotta have fun doing it making it your own for the longest time i was probably at fault for just boring my way through podcast episodes only because i wanted content necessarily mm -hmm. that's not the answer necessarily it's just doing something that you're happy with that means making a film which i'm fucking giddy about i'm so happy that i'm just like it's it's the most random bs for two mm -hmm. hours and i'm surprised i got two hours out of it um you just gotta find what you want to do life is way too short to spend any of your time being miserable. Life is way too short being miserable about everything, even the politics stuff. It's fucking yep. tasking. 
just yeah look at it like how i do where i just laugh at every goddamn thing that happens i'm like jesus christ there's a goddamn omicron variant we got a fucking <laughs> futurama i thought of the planet mm-hmm. zerg or he goes i am zerg from planet omicron percy i ate that's what he would mm-hmm. say and i'm like i fucking <laughs> thought of that but everybody's posting transformer memes i'm like all right, all right. yeah 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 <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I think that having purpose in your life and finding things that, that keep you moving on forward and keeping the spirits high, I think those are all very, very important things. And too many people fill their lives with stuff that's like depressing and, you know, gets them down and it, it takes them further down instead of, you know, lifting them up. But I think doing the podcast is definitely given given purpose. I, I think, you know, with the amount of stuff that, that you've learned along the way, you're probably going to be able to lend some of that. Even if you decide not to continue on, you're probably going to be able to have some expertise and, and support other folks in doing theirs and, and, and give them some wisdom, warning them about, you know, what content uh, to put out versus, you know, just getting content going, but either, rather spend some time making some more quality. Uh, I'm going to write a book. Know. I'm going to do that in December. I'll write a book both my time off but it'll be a book where I'm writing and then I'll have like a little conspiracy rant in the thing where I'll be like, <laughs> you can find life's simplest pleasures by just sitting and trying a new experience every single day. It's not a wish that you need granted. It's an option that you have, which is maybe one day you decide to go sit on a rock and just look at an old radio and blend through the frequency channels. And then there'll be a bracket below that that just goes and listen to Al Gore talk shit about climate change. And it's just you like and your, <laughs> your tangents. <laughs> you should totally make your entire book about tangents i should just like <laughs> next thing you know i'm on like having a deep story on page one and then i go into a political elite page like tyrant for like 14 pages. you could just do like a choose your own adventure book do you want to what path do you want to go down go down the political <laughs> shit. everything boils back down to the political shit go back down yeah <laughs> um that's it's funny. i mean it's a good idea though but that's stuff i like to do too i think um i have not one say i'm gifted in the aspect but uh, not to sound egotistical but i'm just i see the world differently and i've always mm-hmm. kind of seen that whether it's like photos you'll see a lot with this film when it does get released is that you'll look at a lot of shots like that's fucking interesting like that you see it that way because a lot of people i show to they go i never even thought about doing that like that's very smart and creative i'm like it's not smart and creative it's just i see thing a little bit differently than some people do and whether you want to blame that to like maybe i have a slight bit of autism i don't know um, I do see things a little bit kind of like, oh, there's this layer, whether it's like looking at it from a different angle or tackling it. I think you can do that with anything that you do. I think everyone has that ability to, which is about, do you recognize that there's that other angle there, but people are very, very one track, one type of thinking when they get their opinions built up. And that's where I don't have really anything that I'm super strongly involved in, like even mm-hmm. vaccine talk, political talk, any of that stuff. I'm like, I'm open to an ear to listen to someone talk about stuff. yeah but because you're that way it kind of feels like anyone can be that way but i think from personal experience there are tons of people who are just not like us you know that's true i know and they <laughs> and they have no idea they i mean i run into them all the time uh but i think you being a creative you you I think you can get some pretty cool perspectives on things and, and follow things down different pathways that other people would never even think about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, unfortunately, I think, well, I don't, I, maybe I shouldn't say unfortunately, but I think that we are kind of that rare, that rare breed where we can see stuff from a lot of different angles and, and see the creativity in something and, or maybe the truth in something that other people wouldn't normally even see. Do you drink milk? uh yeah not very often but yeah i drink milk do you damn it that was my biggest conspiracy theory i was like i asked Uh-oh. my buddy i was like why do we all think like this deeply about stuff like why do we think it seems like logically like why are we rational people to like it mm-hmm. you know we're not going to be dismissive of someone or as long as they're not forcing anything on us we don't really care what they do or you know that type of thing and he goes i think it's the milk and i'm like yeah <laughs> that is it's the fucking milk we both don't everyone i've asked about that they don't drink milk but you're like the one person like i drink kind of yeah i drink a little yeah bit of milk. i mean I, I don't drink a whole lot of it, but yeah. It, but I think that when I was a kid, I, I definitely didn't look at life this way. You know, I'm way more skeptical now. I mean, th- think about it. I grew up as a as a very conservative Christian, like Seventh-day Adventist, you know, like cross very, yeah, <laughs> to be so scared. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just, I lived in a bubble. There wasn't a whole lot of exposure to the outside world. It, it, 
the Adventist bubble is very, very small. You knew everyone in it and you knew th these are the things that you're allowed to talk about and, and believe. And once I kind of got out of that, I think that's when my creativity and my, yeah, my, my skepticism started to come out. Now I, I didn't really have a desire to learn stuff when I was a kid. I mean, some, th some things that were, you know, relevant to me, um, you know, some sports stuff, but as an adult, I'm so curious. I mean, uh, the, the, the documents that you sh were showing me, the, um, you know, these different conspiracies that, that you bring up, I'm like very curious about knowing more about it. Uh, my, my buddy Dave was just, you know, telling me this other conspiracy about nine 11. And I'm like, I've never heard of any of this stuff. You gotta, you gotta point me in the direction of learning some more. Curiosity to me has changed my life. It allows me to have a much more broad and more accepting um, stance on just about anything. Like even if there, it's, there's a whole bunch of red flags on a specific topic, it doesn't matter to me. I'm still curious about learning, even if I don't believe that. You know, it's like my. Um, my religious background, it was really against my religion to know about other religions because it was supposed to like you know, influence me into moving away from the one that I had grown up in. And now I'm so fascinated by all these other cultures and other religions um, that I just think that that's how you grow as a person. That's how you get to see these different perspectives. And my guess is you're probably more and more, even at, at your 23 you know, your young age, it's like your mind is now in a position to, to be more accepting of listening 24 and tomorrow. getting more. 24. Ooh, happy early birthday. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's at the end of the year. Uh, but for me, I would say that the way that I think is because like people go like, you have an authority problem. I go, when I was a kid, I basically was all mm -hmm. by myself. My parents mm -hmm. worked two jobs, something like that. And it was just me kind of forging out my own thoughts, which I think I think that's why I probably think a lot differently. So it's very, very hard when someone says they're telling you to do this. Fuck that. Nobody tells me to do anything because nobody was fucking there. Like you start getting to that aspect of things where that's why authority just doesn't work on me. Now that I can chalk that up to my conclusion of why I can think and be open and kind of hear people out. As long as you're not telling or speaking down to me, we're on good terms. But with mm -hmm. like a conspiracy, I got one for you. I just thought of this is my own created one. Oh. I think they're keeping information from us, the government is, about the giants. I think we killed them off. And I think they think society is too sensitive that if they did – if we did find out that we killed off the giants, then maybe people will be like, oh, my God, like we're fighting over like race issues and all these other things, which you can fight over. That's a laudable things to fight over. But mm -hmm. in an aspect of like nothing gets solved, like you're more focused on the boot that's on your neck rather than the person who's sticking the boot on your neck, like, you know. Uh -huh. So I think oh, the yeah. giants thing is like all these people have remnants and remains of giants and all these civilizations. But much, much like my buddy uh, Chris, who like goes and searches the river Mirsi of um, these rubble from Viking iron bog sites, he found out that they have pagan roots. The UK, none of those people will fund a project to go explore any deeper into that because nobody wants to know that they have pagan roots over there. And that's they're losing a giant chunk of history because of that, or maybe a possibility of their origin story in a sense. I think that's the same thing with the giants. There's always remains mm -hmm. of giant long bones in these ancient like, species, but nobody knows what happened to them. I go, probably because we killed them off. I mean, imagine if the government's keeping a secret that at one point we were all cannibals, which we definitely were when we were first starting out. Definitely people ate other people. But you start right. to wonder is like if they're keeping that and we're just forgot about it. Imagine if they gave a giant kind of culture shock to our origin stories how many people could handle it and i think that's my little conspiracy behind the giants thing i that's a good I, I like that conspiracy uh dave was just telling me he's like you know different show topics and stuff and one of the things he wanted to talk about was this idea of there once were, were giants like significant not like nba basketball giants we're talking much bigger than uh nba nine uh, foot centers. femurs were found in the uk my buddy was telling me about yeah uh, and I, I'm just, I'm like, you know, these are areas that I haven't heard about since I was a little kid. My grandma told me all kinds of different stories, the biblical stories, and said, even had a book that she would read from that talked about um, giant humans. And, and I just sort of dismissed it, like, you know, I don't see any of that stuff today. Why would I believe that it existed back then? But like I said, I'm very fascinated by these different uh, stories, these different potential um, uh, evidence that these things could have existed. And 
I, I'm going to have to look into it a bit more. I, you know, I don't spend the time online looking at conspiracies nearly as much as I probably should, because I think there's always a little bit of truth in, in any of these little, in, in any of these uh, stories. I would call them mysteries, not conspiracies. Like, yeah, conspiracy yeah. seems like it has an anti-government kind of notion. Yeah, to I think that's the better term. Little but I mean, like yeah. people even say evolution is a conspiracy. I'm like, how is evolution a conspiracy that we came from chimps? When I'm, there's like plenty of evidence that there is evidence that we did evolve from chimps through in like the Darwin process. But you start to realize a lot of those people were religious that were telling you it's yeah. a conspiracy theory. They don't like that idea. But there was a thought that the species of people that we stemmed from were the species of people that hid in caves. And that's how they survived when like the ice age happened and all these kind of global resets, whether you want to talk about the younger driest theory. And we think we evolved from those because a lot of people either stayed outside and tried to fight and they ended up dying or you went inside and hid and just stayed hidden. That's why uh, Alex Jones talks about how mm -hmm. we come from like shrew people, which are like mole yeah. type people, mostly because you shelter yourself off from the sunlight. Now we could have had a whole different pathway with tunneling into the earth or doing things of that sort, because when you don't experience light for a very long time, your body starts to adapt and evolve weird. Like I think the age mm -hmm. of a woman, I think it's in the 1920s, the age of a man back then is the average age of a woman now, like their weight, like you start realizing there's more food. So then you grow bigger. People were very, very small back in the twenties era. They're thin, very, very small, much like North Korea. Now they don't have a lot of food. I mean, Naomi Park is 80 something pounds. She's a 30 something year old woman from North Korea. Who's a defector. There's no food over there. They don't grow big. So her body stays small. Her, a picture of her next to Rogan and Rogan's like five foot six or five foot seven, a picture of her next to Rogan. She's as tall as Rogan, but she's so super, super strong in and thin. Like it looks like a, like if you touched her, she'd snap in half. You realize mm -hmm. it's like a koi fish. The bigger the pond, the bigger the koi fish will grow more food, bigger people will grow. It's how we have massive people now, not just obese, but huge football star athlete players and all these types of things. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't explain the giants, but explains kind of our evolutionary adaption and survival aspects of that. Maybe if there was a whole entire timeline where we just stayed underground and then we try to maybe we lose our vision and our hearing would get that type of like sonar that bats have. I have no clue. Well, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, pressures, na natural pressures uh, in the environment to 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 be a certain way. I mean, I, I like to use the, the example of giraffes, you know, giraffes evolved. Um, to be taller and taller because the people or the people, the giraffes that have, you know, the tallest necks have access to the food sources that others don't. And when you're reproducing and you have an advantage in that environment and you continue to reproduce, then those genes get passed on. It's, uh, you know, these different environmental changes that, that happen, you know, th we did an episode quite a few uh, gosh, quite a few months ago. And we were talking about these uh, giraffes that had uh, dwarfism and they were discovered out on one of these uh, nature preserves. And if you think about in a regular natural environment, those giraffes probably wouldn't survive to reproduce because the natural predators and the food sources, the likelihood of them passing on their genes is pretty low. But the the, the giraffes that have grown to be super tall and, and not just tall in, in their neck, but also, um, you know, their lips and their tongue, you know, they can take stuff off an acacia tree, which is thorny and very stiff. And so they've been able to continually reproduce and evolve through, you know, potentially, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years, who knows, um, with like humans, uh, food sources are somewhat, rare way back in the day now we have this abundance of food especially in certain cultures and we, now we've got this massive uh, potential mix of genes with all these different types of, of, uh, of humans from all over the world and you know we talk about the idea that your eyes if you're in the dark well think about we have different ways to solve blindness with glasses contact lenses surgeries but that doesn't change the genes that created that deficiency in the first place. I haven't noticed my eyesight sense? like going to shit because um, oh, I'm yeah. staring at my phone way Not too much. Not 30 yet. Well, it's, I'm sitting in front of a <laughs> fucking computer screen for the past three and a half years. Yeah. That fucking light is blinding me because my room's so dim. So if I do redo my studio, I got to get more fucking lights in this bitch. <laughs> I'm not going fucking blind. Um, 
But yeah. what do you, what but do you... think about those deficiencies, you know, like your eyes, you know, if, if you have bad eyes, but it doesn't prevent you from reproducing the genes that potentially gave you bad eyes will continue to go into the next generations, which potentially could result in further poor eyesight in the generations to come. But we're able to, to combat that because of these artificial ways of solving that problem. A lot of other species wouldn't normally have that. You think about the eyes of an eagle or something and how good they are. Well, it's because it, they've had to be good. They have bad eyesight. They're going to get taken out by some other species. Survival of the fittest. Um, yeah, survival of this and, I, or the good in, enough. It leads into my um, conspiracy theory about like all these people. Like, you know, how I talked about earlier th about three years that shift in society has changed so dramatically. Mm -hmm. The alpha males in back in way back in the day before I was born, when you were probably in high school or elementary school, there was the jocks. I'm not saying yep. you're old. I'm just saying <laughs> more like revenge like of the, the nerds gray. time period. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> um, revenge of the nerds time period where there was the jocks, the alpha males, the guys are good at sports. They were the ones that women sought after. Now you're looking at billionaires wearing sweaters like Bill Gates <laughs> because society has shifted. And now that's the evolution thing. So now the alpha males are going to be bred out. So now we're entering a society where maybe in a future generations, you'd be seeing more people with brain power than strength yeah. or, you know, even a dad bod coming back. You know, people love the dad bod. Now it's not even about muscles. Like it used to be in Arnold's day. Um, mm -hmm. That's an evolutionary adaption where the alpha male gets bred out. Then the next, you know, the beta is the next one that goes up and now they're the alpha males. And then it's a whole societal shift that happens so much where we talk about things changing so quickly. I mean, I see so much evolution happening sooner or later. This is going to be more acceptable. This can be, which is good if that person feels that way, but then it popularizes it and then everyone can do whatever, like, Oh, I don't even want to go down the whole gender thing. My grandma's a lesbian and she told me, she was like, don't, is that even a thing anymore? And I'm like, what lesbian? She goes, yeah. She goes, I read an article that says that you're, you're, you can be whatever transphobic on, uh, until you don't care about your date's genitalia. And she was like, well, if I would have not cared about my date's genitalia, I would have just slept with a guy and it would have been fine, but I only was attracted to women. And I was like, yeah, that does annihilate you from the, the mix. Doesn't it? <laughs> and, and she's like, yeah, so is that still a thing? And I'm like, I don't know. People can do whatever the hell they want now. If they want to mm -hmm. be a fish, they can be a fish. It's so hard to tell if someone's fucking around or not. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. what? It's like the UFO community. When I get involved in there, I'm like, is this person fucking with me when they're talking about future people? I have no clue. <laughs> um, but, you know, I don't, I'm open to it all. So go ahead, mm -hmm. do your thing, live your life. I don't care. Just don't try and influence mine in any way. I want to be happy. I want to do what I want to do as long as I can go to the store and get my milk and do whatever <laughs> I want to do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, your milk. <laughs> but honestly, I don't even think we need to be worrying about future generations because I think as people, we're going to end up breeding out of tubes. Um, I know mm -hmm. that sounds crazy, but the amount of plastic consumption that we've been using has been shrinking each generation's taint size smaller and smaller and smaller, and the taint size is linked to the fertility count in people. Um, I've read something about that. Yeah, I've talked about it a couple mm -hmm. of times, even pulled up the study about it from, I think her name's Savannah something. She was on Joe Rogan talking about it, but the mm -hmm. percentage count in, from like the 1920s has dropped from 97% to what it's at now, which is like 42% or something like that. So eventually we're probably going to breed ourselves into sterilization. I mean, you hear more about misconcept or uh, miscarriages and all these types of things now, mm -hmm. which leads it to the CRISPR. I mean, implementing that mm -hmm. even more, using that as a reliance way. But then you have to be, what, above a certain income to be able to breed. And if you don't make that income, you don't get to breed. So we don't carry on future genetics. It just makes it easier for evolution to happen to create the perfect species. But it's very, very strange when the people who are choosing what the parameters are, are the ones rigging the system. Let's say I don't want a generation. I don't want people to have blue eyes anymore. Anybody with blue eyes, you can't breed. Well, why can't yeah. you just take that gene out of the future generations? No, I don't care. We got to reduce people anyway. I think Jordan Peterson is the one that said that population is going to get to 9 billion and then it's going to start going back down. You'll see a drastic increase or decrease because mm -hmm. I think eventually people will just breed themselves to a point where there's no possibilities of breeding unless it's through a machine, which is eventually just going to reduce it. I have no clue. I was listening to Ben Shapiro talk about- Absolutely um, fine. Absolutely fine. <laughs> uh, he was talking about the uh, the reproduction uh, rates right now, and in the U.S., um, it's just under two, which is not sustaining. Um, and especially like in, even in um, 
I think he was talking about, you know, Asian countries where the reproduction rate was less than two. And uh, in, in certain areas, they're just barely over two. Well, if, if that's the case and you're not producing more, um, how do you grow the population? Um, that's a good question. You know, there might be certain areas. Well, the Mormons have got it pretty nailed down, though. You know, they have huge families. I grew up with a bunch of uh, Mormon friends, and they all had like five, six, eight siblings. I mean, holy cow. But that's just one dad who's just going to multiple different families. Yeah, and banging right. it out. We yeah, can't but rely then it, on it one could be generational. <laughs> I will say we can't rely on one powerhouse fucker to handle all the fucking population <laughs> growth for us. <laughs> Uh, yeah but i mean it's it's one of those things that, who knows what the future is going to hold you know with different populations and you know and we're you know so angry with each other so many different times it's like who knows when war will break out and there's going to be a huge decrease you know um in in population or of a certain culture i mean who knows but um but i, I do find the evolution uh topic very interesting because there's just so much there that you almost knowing enough about evolution, you could kind of guess the direction that things could go, even though you may not know what these small little mutations might, might be just looking at what natural selection um, does, you might be able to guess. And then of course, then the artificial selection, which you're, you're talking about, hey, get rid of the, the blue eyes. Let's use CRISPR and manipulate the DNA. And, <laughs> you know, that might have some unintended uh, consequences, but you, might actually be able to predict certain characteristics that will then be bigger or you know, smaller or more I dominant. recommend episode 991 of mine. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I'm going to end up changing the name, but it's like uh, follow the rules or something like that. I called it. Um, it's mm -hmm. hard to come up with names this far in. And yeah. um, I pulled up the CRISPR side effects of why they were getting sued. And a lot of the CRISPR things were like a person that was given an AIDS diagnosis that didn't eventually have AIDS, a person that was told that they their baby that they miscarried didn't miscarry, a lot of like false diagnoses Ooh. and a lot of these things. And this thing to fix the chromosomal issues that were happening inside the womb, which they said that they could do, they would put in there, the body would just give up. The body would go. I don't think we can save this and delete the whole chromosome. So people were wow. being born without arms and shit. Like you couldn't have that. They just deleted that whole chromosome part to them. They were like, well, we can't save it. Instead of your body naturally trying to find a way to fix it. It just said, fuck it. And threw the rest of the batch, like our bodies can do some stuff amazingly naturally. But when you start implementing like a little bit of something else in there, like this is like the big thing with like the vaccines and stuff too. You got to be fucking careful, man. Cause like your yeah. body knows what to do. And you're also, your body is a self-regulated machine. It's like trying to download more shit onto your high hard drive after it says it's full, your hard drive just says, fuck it. And takes a shit on you. And I got to go buy a whole new hard drive. The issue here is you can't buy a whole new body. Yeah. Like, um, it's strange times. What, what episode was that? You said nine, nine, what? one. 991 okay i'm gonna go back and <laughs> i'm gonna go back to those archives <laughs> well, i'll say that's 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 that this recent um actually that was probably yeah. that's today when we're recording but um yeah mm -hmm. all of them are about two hours long which i gotta ask you i know you said 12 we might have to end it because we're about to go on the one hour 40 mark and i want to oh. do the film part to you yeah time flies yeah well when you're talking yeah. about government shit it's always fun right I know. Well, I know. <laughs> um, Evolution and religion. Darwinism. <laughs> Earth is flat now. <laughs> <Where's> the, <laughs> where can people find you, Scott? Uh, they can find more information on nevertoserious.com. Uh, you can also find me on social media at, uh, at the NTS podcast. I will link it all in the description. Is there anything you want to say to anybody out there listening before we wrap up the show? No, just, you want, just support podcasts, support small shows. Um, tell your friends, I think, spread the word on, on some of these folks that are working so hard to create content for you. And punch a veteran. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that a lot of people are like, yes. No, um, just be good people. That's all. Just be good yeah. people. <laughs>